Uh, good afternoon. On behalf of McDonald Hopkins and Lazier Capital Partners, I want to thank you for joining us today for our webinar, Countermeasures Against Organizational, organizational and Economic Distress. Quite a mouthful. Uh, my name is Pete Willeen. I'm the managing member of the Columbus office of the law firm of McDonald Hopkins, and I'm going to be your moderator today. Uh, we do have uh, four outstanding panelists for our discussion today. Uh, Crystal Contini um, is uh, co-chair of the Mergers and Acquisitions Practice Group at McDonald Hopkins. Uh, Michael Casca, he's a member of the McDonald Hopkins Business Restructuring Department. Uh, Bruce Lazier, founding partner of Lazier Capital Partners, and Sherry Lazier, general counsel at Lazier Capital Partners. Um, we plan to have a moderated discussion here today that involves a lot of interaction between our four panelists on a number of questions that face businesses who are experiencing distress themselves or who are dealing with distressed businesses. Um, we, we intend to discuss perspectives from the buyers and sellers sides of transactions when dealing with a distressed business. Um, we'll talk about a transaction risk continuum uh, and what that means uh, and what uh, in what context you, you need to, to consider it. Uh, we'll talk about preparations and considerations to deal with a potentially distressed uh, transaction. And if there's some time uh, for some uh, real life insights into, into distressed deals, um, we'll do that uh, along with um, uh, how to maybe preserve human capital when you get into a distressed uh, business transaction and and even um, we'll talk a little bit about loan to own strategies if we get that far. Our panelists will be happy to address questions from the audience at the conclusion of the presentation. Uh, you can submit your questions by email, emailing them to events at mcdonaldhopkins.com at any time during the webinar. We'll collect those and then uh, as we get towards the end of the, the presentation, we'll, we'll do our best to answer uh, most if not all the questions that uh, are, are submitted to us. Additionally, um, the, the slides our panelists are using can be found on the GoToWebinar control panel in the handout section. I'll caution you ahead of time, this is not a, um, a slide specific presentation. I think we've only got four or five, but um, they are there if you want to look at them. Um, so we have a lot to cover um, and a lot of good uh, uh, discussion to be had. So let's get started. Um, I'm, I'm going to start out with um, uh, Bruce and Sherry Lazier to set the scene a little bit here. They're going to tell you a little bit about <coughs> Lazier Capital. But then um, what, what I'd like uh, you to address, Bruce and Sherry, is that from a high level business standpoint, what are the warning signs of financial distress in the company to get us started here? Thank you, uh, Pete. Um, a quick introduction. Bruce Lazier is my name, founded the firm over 20 years ago. We're an investment banking firm. We represent people selling their companies, lots of them ESOPs and construction companies kind of as our niche. And it's a nationwide practice. When I started the firm, I was actually a former M&A lawyer who grew up around bankruptcy lawyers. So we've always been involved in distress matters. And I've had the opportunity to advise on numerous uh, distress transactions, but also have been an active investor with my own capital and buying troubled companies over the years. Sherry, a second on you. Hi, I'm uh, Sherry Lazier. Good afternoon. Um, I spent the first 30 years of um, my legal practice as an attorney at a large um, law firm specializing in um, construction and bankruptcy litigation. Um, I am now the general counsel of Lazier Capital Partners and work on our ESOP transactions um, in the construction industry as well as working on um, distress transactions. So now to answer your questions, the signs of distress. I mean, I'm going to go from the very beginning where I call the seeds are sown. The earliest issue often is the client the, does not understand capital. They actually don't understand a balance sheet. They understand their income statement, not their balance sheet. They don't understand things like the growth of inventory that will never be sold. And they, they don't understand capital. And, and honest to goodness, that's the first thing. And usually that can be the root of it. Um, they'll have strategy issues. Maybe they have an attrition of some key customers or margins are going down. They're chasing those key customers with ever lower margins, uh, losing employees and, and bad financial information. The idea that you're getting your financial statements late 
or people don't really account for things correctly can have a tremendous influence on it. The mid-warning signs, what I call performance begins to suffer, you see a decrease in financial performance, which is cash flow from operations. There are balance sheet implications uh, for that. I know we have many bankers here. I know you guys understand this. And you start tripping financial covenants with your bank. And the bank covenants, many of these folks who are borrowers and in trouble think that the bank covenants are some onerous thing. They don't understand they're actually like a doctor testing if you have high blood pressure or sick. They don't understand the covenants test. They don't understand why they really are signs of trouble. Maybe you have a, an audit opinion that, that has a going concern carve out. And, and, and common amongst debtors is what I call living in denial. They've been losing money for a while. Things are getting worse. And they can't come to terms to deal with the reality of where they actually are. And then in more uh, late warnings of distress is when I call this the cash is king portion. This is where liquidity begins to dry up. Hopefully, your clients start to understand what liquidity is, but this is a significant sign when you can't pay your bills in the ordinary course. That's really the definition of insolvency. And you are stretching out your trade creditors and whether you're selecting to pay key vendors and replacing non-key vendors, you're maxed on your line of credit. Um, I had a workout officer who we represented once. He referred to the P word. And what was the P word? Payroll, as in we aren't going to make payroll. So then it gets down to liquidity forecasting and really understanding how to buy time to look at other options, which will be really the source of this discussion. And you're sitting in the special assets department of the bank, and you're just trying to buy time to find a means by which you can protect your personal guarantee, save employment, and create opportunities yet from this trouble. So that's kind of a quick overview of the signs of distress as they progress from the sowing the seeds underlying problems to more extreme. Okay, um, uh, thanks, Bruce. Uh, I think that's helpful. That helps us set the scene as we go forward. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about buyers' uh, concerns uh, in transactions as we go forward on this. But uh, based on what you see in your business, and again, Bruce or Sherry, what are most sellers and owners worried about when moving forward with a distressed transaction? The the biggest concern we see with the, the sellers or owners is personal liability um, on on a personal guarantee. Um, they they want to negotiate for a release of this liability um, in, as part of any distressed transaction. Um, our, our owners and sellers um, are also interested in retaining employment for themselves if the company is being sold and whether their team is going to be able to um, have continuing employment after a transaction. Um, our owners are also worried about retaining um, the customers and will they be able to service the customers um, after any transaction. There are many other concerns, but those are the key ones. Okay, uh, that's good. So I think that leads into maybe what we'll talk about with uh, with, with Michael. Um, we have a slide um, that we'll put up here uh, in just a moment. There it is. Um, and Michael, I'd like you to uh, uh, talk a little bit about this. Uh, and given what we've just heard, uh, what are the ways to mitigate future risk in a, in a transaction involving a distressed business? Sure. Um, thank you, everyone, for for joining us. So we we, we came up with this sort of um, little slide. It's uh, nothing earth shattering, and you know we call it transaction risk continuum. It could be a continuum of a lot of things. It could be you know <laughs> the cost continuum of what's least to most expensive. It could be a speed continuum. What could you do most quickly versus what tends to take a little bit. It could be a successor liability continuum. You know what essentially you know. You start at one point where you're basically stepping into the shoes and potential liabilities versus a bankruptcy 363 sale where you know you're you're getting a court order that essentially um, you know cuts all of those off to the benefit of the purchaser. So I think you know we, we talk about you know so we there's other things that could you know beyond this continuum, but we figure these are sort of bigger picture. And again, you know we're we're, we're talking here about you know the middle market companies um, and you know, privately held for the most part. And the types of ways in which you know after 
Bruce and, and Sherry mentioned, you know, what the concerns are for the business. Okay, how do you how do you get to a transaction mm -hmm. before you actually put pen to paper? You got to figure out, okay, what's the type of structure we're going to put around uh, that transaction to accomplish our goals? And of course, every transaction is different. And I think you know part of the issue is is you got to weigh the stakeholder, um, you know considerations, right? I mean, if you've got a bank that is, you know, or a lender that's completely underwater, um, you know, and, and they're the only one who's likely to receive any value out of this, well, then you got to take something like that into account. You got to take into account the types of liabilities that a company has. So just a very brief um, explanation of sort of each of these. I and mean, the equity purchase might be a situation where, you know, if you're just buying something for a dollar, you know, buy the stock of a business and then step into those liabilities and negotiate with those creditors as sort of a new party, new ownership with a little bit more financial backing. That might be a reason to do an equity purchase. It might also, you want to preserve some tax attributes of, of, uh, of the company that you're essentially buying the equity of. You know, we see that sometimes and there's certain instances where maybe in the middle of some sort of ownership structure, you buy in and maybe you, you buy a subsidiary off of a business that's that subsidiary is having a little trouble for the overall business so a buyer may want to do an equity deal take the stock move on and see what um, the buyer can do to help sort of turn around that business an asset purchase is exactly what it is and you're going to buy just the assets of the business um you know you can do it via a private sale it's a it, you know and essentially you run a bit more risk of you know someone claiming success or liability in that type of scenario but an asset purchase is something that can be done depending on the circumstances and the speed with which one needs to go forward article 9 sale is usually driven by you know the, a secured creditor um, and it only would involve the personal property of the, the the selling entity and you could essentially within a very short amount of time 10 to 20 days depending on the type of structure take you know, that personal property and essentially strip all the liens out uh, by virtue of just following the proper steps under Article 9 of the uh, Uniform Commercial Code, which has been adopted in all the states, and you could essentially transfer those assets to a new buyer. Article 9 sales are also quick. Um, they don't cost as much, but there is the risk that you're not dealing with any of the unsecured creditors. And depending on the type of liabilities that are, you know, surrounding the business, um, you know, that's it's a consideration that one would want to take into into consideration. But you know, banks are happy or lenders are happy to unload just you know their collateral that way, finding a willing buyer. Or if you've got a non-traditional lender, they could even essentially use Article Nine to foreclose and take back ownership of that collateral and, and essentially operate it themselves or spin it out. Um, their own particular way. Receivership, and, and we, you could also put, you know, it's not popular in Ohio, but you're gonna put an assignment for the benefit of creditors into this category. Receivership is, you know, the, the benefits of, you know, you do have a court, um, it could be state or federal court. It's, you know, receiverships are initiated generally by either uh, a creditor, or they could be initiated by, you know, a shareholder dispute. You know, maybe the, the, the owners of the company, company's having some problems and they can't agree on a course of action and say, you know what, let's just point a third party to sort of, do the do the wind down or often you see creditors who are worried um, about you know the assets and and the conduct of the ownership of the business leading it down to a particular path that they'll seek uh, you know uh, an order of the court appointing a receiver and receiver has you know there's a lot of flexibility in Ohio you know the statutes old and not terribly long um, and so there is uh, sort of court oversight um, you know, assignment for the benefit of creditors, it's run through the probate court in Ohio. So it's not a, it's not a, a, a typical situation that's used here, but in other states, it's actually very attractive. They're almost run like mini bankruptcies. And then finally, you've got the bankruptcy 363 sale, which is, it's, it's the most costly, but it also ensures sort of the least amount of risk, certainly to the buyer, um, because you, you know, a bankruptcy court order is pretty powerful to cut off uh, certain success or liability claims. But in addition, you also have the benefit of, of, of running a process. You know, creditors are all on notice. Everything is sort of in the sunlight. And so, you know, in terms of being second guessed or whatever, you also have court approval and all those things. So in terms of, you know, when we talk about the risk continuum, I mean, you can look at this both from the perspective of the seller and the buyer and, and what their ultimate goals are. So these are just some sort of structures that within those structures, Crystal, we'll talk about a little bit further about how one, um, you know, can you know, the considerations within each as you're dealing between seller and purchaser. Okay, um, uh, thanks, Michael. Um, before we get to Crystal, um, let's go back to Bruce um, and where you, you talked earlier about sellers 
but put on a different hat now and, and tell the group what the concerns of buyers are uh, that you see when moving forward with a distressed transaction. Yeah, so the buyers, if they're trying to do a going concern purchase, you're not just buying assets to liquidate. The biggest issue is the retention of revenue. I mean, if I'm buying this business, the core of the business is the revenue and the customer relationships. So understanding, are those customers being, have they been well taken care of or have they felt the signs of distress? Are they consider, considering leaving? I mean, that's the first thing. Am I getting the revenue line? Then if I can get the revenue line, the next question is, do I get the people that support the revenue line? If there's a salesman with a deep connection to the relationship of the key customers, if that guy didn't or, or, or woman doesn't come with me, that person doesn't join, I could lose that revenue. So there's a people lockup as part of this. What about the processes? How sophisticated is servicing this customer? Does it take a worldwide supply chain? Or is this something that's done in a facility in, in, in you know in the client's facility that can easily be moved to a strategic buyer? Um, the other thing I'm looking at as the buyer is, I'm wondering about the asset value that appears to be there. When I talked earlier about owners not understanding capital, one of the common ones, if you have anyone with inventory in their business is, the client, do they really understand their inventory? For instance, if you have a company whose sales are going down and inventory is ever getting bigger, it's a pretty bad sign. What it usually means is they have, they have excess inventory at the minimum mean way more than they can sell to those customers or maybe obsolete inventory and if they haven't relieved it off their balance sheet the net impact is they've been losing way more money than it looks like because they've never taken the beating required to write off that inventory so when if i'm a buyer and i'm looking at asset values as part of the support of my purchase price i'm interested in are the inventory, is it good? Are the receivables good? My purchase price may be a function of the assets I'm getting. And if the purchase price is calculated based on assets, an understanding of the value of those assets really, really matters. And while I'm thinking a lot now and talking a lot about what's in it for me to hold together, and, and, there's, and I've invested in a bunch of these. So let me tell you what I like about being the buyer. I'm getting a going concern at probably close to liquidation value. That can be a home run if done well. If not done well, it can be bad. And the other side of it, the concern of the buyers, what about liabilities you're assuming? And Sherry Lazier is going to talk about liability assumption issues. Yes, thank you, Bruce. Um, I'd like to follow up on something that uh, Michael mentioned on our transaction risk continuum. Um, that would be um, the Article 9 sale. Um, you would think in an Article 9 sale that you don't have that many concerns about successor liability um, in, in a properly conducted Article 9 sale. However, um, we were involved um, you know, in a situation um, several years ago where there was a duly conducted Article 9 sale, a big national bank um, you know, was, was the lender in that transaction, excellent counsel on, on all sides of the transaction. And unfortunately, a foreign vendor sued the, um, the NUCO in um, state court alleging successor liability for monies owed to, to the foreign vendor. And while the purchaser did prevail, this case went up to the Supreme Court of a Midwestern state and hundreds of thousands of dollars were spent um, on legal fees. So, um, you know, one of the, you know, large concerns of a, uh, a buyer is, is there going to be successor liability and how do you protect against that? Um, and in some transactions, like the, this particular transaction I'm mentioning, a bankruptcy 363 sale wouldn't have worked. I mean, it would have been way, way too expensive um, to do that. Um, and you know, perhaps if there hadn't been a foreign vendor, this wouldn't have happened. But but it did, and we have to just you know keep that keep that in mind as you look at this risk continuum. All right, um, I think that is an important thing to remember too, because uh, successor liability surprises a lot of people, I'm sure. Um, so we've talked a little bit about what you see and what some of the risks are and how those risks can be mitigated and some of the, the ways you can go about doing that on this risk continuum. Um, let's talk a bit about best mechanisms for a particular transaction. Uh, 
this is uh, probably uh, a question for all four of you, uh, but let's let's uh, start with Michael. Crystal, we haven't forgotten about you. You're up next. Uh, Michael, what uh, what can you you tell us about uh, best mechanisms for particular transaction and how you get there? Sure, and and I think this, I think this dovetails off of some of the comments Bruce and Sherry just um, laid out. I, you know, when, when I think of mechanisms that okay, as an insolvency lawyer, either as working with a company that's distressed or someone who wants to buy a distressed company, you know, what's the best way for us to achieve this goal using perhaps one of the structures that are still up on the screen? And then what considerations go into okay, why does one structure makes perhaps make better sense over the other? And and I would say you know speed and cost. Are two considerations that you know always come to mind one you know the proverbial melting ice cube can the company last long enough in order to ultimately effectuate a transaction or is it just the, the values that can get frittered away depending on you know if it's if it's too long in a bankruptcy or you know what, what, what there's no support from either the lender or some other constituency to fund whether you know you need to pull forward uh, receivables from that that are uh, owed by some of your customers or whatever type of support that's required to sort of get to the end of the transaction to preserve some value um, going forward. Um, and then to, to Bruce's issue, you know, disruption and publicity um, are also considerations. Um, so you know, to the extent that uh, you know a bankruptcy is going to cause you know bad publicity and, and it's going to cause one's vendors to run away. Well then, or or I'm sorry, not vendors, but customers run away because they're worried about that. Maybe there's another way to structure it. Um, publicity, you know, do you want to try to keep this as low profile as possible and let the assets change hands and you know sort of negotiate quietly and and move forward with the stakeholders, or is this going to become something that's uh, on the front pages? Um, I think oversight is a consideration. Um, you know, in equity or asset purchases, it's their private transactions. As you move forward into Article Nine, there's a notice period, and, and notice needs in publication and other things. So there's going to be at least some creditor notice that's provided there. Certainly, in a receivership and a bankruptcy, you're going to be in front of the judge um, and, and have you know there's due process considerations for creditors and timeframes and other things that one needs to sort of understand and and so there's going to be some level of oversight and approval for what uh we're trying to accomplish and then you know the ability to bind creditors um you know if, if you're doing an asset purchase or an article 9 sale and you got to transfer some you know some some contracts or you know you need you need perhaps a bankruptcy because there's built-in laws and rules that help one move um, you know, you could transfer and assign contracts as long as you're following the provisions of the bankruptcy code. That might be a consideration. I mean, I, Crystal and I were in a deal, oh gosh, it was about a little over a year ago. It was in bankruptcy court, and it was one of those situations where the sale was approved, but it took almost nine months for the sale to actually close because there were all kinds of regulatory issues and license transfers and other things that outside of court, it never would have been able to happen. And we were wondering at different points whether it was going to be able to happen, you know, even in the context of the bankruptcy, because you had multiple states and it was a highly regulated industry. So those are things that, you know, one needs to, to consider. And then finally, I always look at the nature of the liabilities, right? If, if you've got something, you know, a company that's got a lot of pension debt, environmental debt, um, some other type of employment related issues, things that, you know, follow uh, assets and businesses, then you got to really think hard about, you know, what type of structure you use. This, that scenario was a bankruptcy, the best way to sort of achieve those ends to mitigate, you know, potential issues. I mean, on some of that stuff, you know, environmental issues, it, it's it's almost impossible to mitigate something completely if you're taking a, an asset that already has some environmental issues and moving it forward. And as long as you put mechanisms in place, Nuco is going to be able to be much better off perhaps than, than the original company. So when I think of mechanisms, that's how I look at it. I think Crystal looks at it sort of differently for, as an M&A lawyer. Yeah. So Crystal, here, here's your chance. And while we're, yep. while you're getting started, uh, we'll go to the next slide here too. We'll, uh, I think that uh, will dovetail into what you're, you're talking a little bit about here too. So, um, um, thanks for waiting patiently. It's no, not a problem. Yeah, so um, it's funny because as I hear all of the different tensions that people are talking about, um, you know, what sellers are worried about, what buyers are worried about, and the different mechanisms to get there, I think it probably becomes clear that there are nuances to all of these options. 
um, particularly when you're in the world of distress, because not all investment bankers and not all lawyers work in this area. Um, so it's really important to get a deal team that actually understands the distressed market because the issues that you're dealing with is the balance of, as Michael called it, the melting ice cube. Um, you aren't just trying to satisfy your um, shareholders, but you also are trying to satisfy your lenders. Um, and so the the duties and the obligations relating to all of these different constituencies becomes really, really important when you're trying to decide on that risk continuum and balance all of the various factors such as time, um, such as um, getting the highest value, releasing personal guarantees, which is you know, where the assemble your deal team, um, I think becomes really important because uh, what I guess what I like to say is the investment banker's job is to make sure you get the highest and best value, which is, you know, something that you often hear in the bankruptcy context. But from a lawyer perspective, our job is to make sure if you are the seller that you actually keep as much of that value if you actually get a recovery in connection with the distress sale and that we limit your post closing liability in any of those um, options. Um, so in addition to assembling your great deal team to kind of help you think through these issues, and, and I know we'll talk a little bit about um, to get your house in order further on, but making sure that you have your house in order becomes also very important as the seller. Um, as the seller, one of the things you're also trying to get is speed and certainty to closing. So to in order to make sure that you actually achieve all of the things that Bruce and Sherry were speaking of, which is making sure that you retain your customers, making sure that you preserve your asset value. The quicker you get to closing, the more likely it is that you are going to be able to preserve those assets. The problem is if you move too quickly, you might miss something, which is where you kind of go back to your assembling um, your seller um, deal team. Um, and then also important considerations for the seller is to try to protect your human capital. I mean, from a seller's perspective, it's not just the products you sell and the services you sell, but it's the people that are actually selling those products of yours. And how do you make sure that you incentivize them to stay with you and then also ensure that they're available for the buyer because in that is quite a bit of value. So part of what the M&A lawyer's job is, is to, find mechanisms, whether it be an incentive bonus or some other type of um, legal mechanism to allow for the payment um, of certain key employees. And this isn't just something you can do in a distress situation between you and your employee. There are other constituencies to think of, such as your lender, because any amount you pay to your employees doesn't get paid to your lender to satisfy your obligations. Um, perhaps the buyer is willing to assume certain liabilities um, to employees because they are also invested in making sure that they um, get that human capital post-closing. Um, so these are these are all considerations where from an M&A lawyer's perspective, we are trying to navigate and balance all of these different um, items in order to try to you know, limit, frankly, your post-closing liability and help to deliver value to the buyer. I'm going to pause there in case anyone else wants to jump in because I know it kind of touches on what everyone has been talking about thus far. Yes, Sherry, um, let, let's go to you uh, from your side of things. Um, what factors uh, do dictate the best mechanism for a particular transaction? What, what do you see? And do you have any uh, kind of real life examples like you already gave us one? Well, I think there is a tension uh, between whether you do a transaction inside or outside of a court, whether it's a state court or a federal court. And I think that, you know, in court, as, as we've seen, it offers more protections um, to the buyer. However, it's more expensive and it's going to be more time consuming, as you talked about that nine month uh, transaction. Um, you know, what we're looking at is what's the size of the business, you know, can it support, um, you know, a, a bankruptcy transaction or is it just going to be too cost prohibitive? 
We're also looking at um, the, the speed of deterioration of the company. If they're missing payroll, then um, you've got to move fast and it, it may be better to do something um, you know, out of court with the right you know, deal team, which is, which is very, um, very important. Bruce, do you have anything to add in terms of uh, you know recent transactions? Well, I mean, you know, I, I actually I'm going to stand back on that. I think you covered that perfectly, both of you. That was great. Okay, um, Crystal. So, and, and you may have already covered this uh, a little bit in what you talked about, but um, what should the selling company be doing to prepare itself for a potentially distressed transaction? So I think probably one of the things we've all realized, particularly given recent events, is that there's not a lot in your control, um, but there are some things. And so what I like to say is control the things you can control. And one of them is your organization. And I know this sounds like such a simple factor, but one of the factors in any sale, but it becomes more acute in a distressed sale because of the timeline that everyone tries to operate on. As a seller, you are going to have to deliver due diligence um, responses to the buyer so that the buyer can make sure that they are effectively getting what they pay for. Um, and so this is as mundane as having all of your key customer contracts PDF'd and uploaded onto some sort of data site. Um, this is as small as um, having all of your leases in one place and have them fully executed and know where all of the attached personal guarantees are. Do you have a full copy of all of your loan documents? These all sound very, very simple. And, and the issue is people always put it off and say, oh, you know what? I'm going to get to that later. I'm really busy with X, Y, Z. And the problem becomes when you're in any sales situation, but particularly in a distress situation, you need to be prepared to move quickly and have this information at your fingertips. On the, buy, on the buyer side, what they're going to do is scour all of these documents and ask a million follow-up questions. And you have a day job as the seller, you are trying to run your business and you're trying to run your business in a very different distressed landscape. You do not have time to mess around and try to find where that lease is that you entered into 25 years ago that you've all been continuing to operate under. So even if you're kind of on the edge of distress, or even if you have a perfectly healthy, normal business, at some point you might want to do succession planning, or at some point you might want to consider a sale or an investment. And in any of those situations, you are going to need to have this, these documents together and organized. And actually it's when you are outside of a sale context that it's easier to get an office manager, an assistant, um, someone to assist you in organizing all of that information because the moment you become in a sales situation, particularly if not all of your employees are aware of it, and then you start peppering people with getting all of these things organized, it starts to make employees nervous and you end up kind of being the sole, the sole person, not only running your business, responding to lenders' questions, fielding questions from buyers, but now you're also you know, digging around in file cabinets trying to find pieces of paper. So it, speed is important. Okay, I, I think that's uh, that's that, that's uh, very obvious. So, Bruce, uh, wh what uh, what kind of due diligence uh, things are you looking for from a a, a buyer's side um, when you're doing due diligence on a distressed company? Yeah, and and I'll use a real real life example of a distressed company we bought. So, give you some facts. So, basically, it was a company that supplied crafts, kids' crafts, in all the WalMarts in North America. So, 2,200 stores there that was 80 percent of the revenue and all the goods are supplied out of china with a long supply chain so what were we concerned about number one was revenue retention because to buy the business meant i have to have walmart so the number one thing was will walmart stand by and allow this distressed transaction to come to us and retain us as a customer so my number one issue is revenue retention my next one is the human capital that really owns that relationship and it's not us we were a financial buyer sitting in columbus ohio um so we had to wrap up the team so in that circumstance that was an important element the next thing um were there customer disruptions or were there disruptions coming because if you got a supply chain that goes halfway around the world is the lack of capital to run that business mean that orders that are, should be arriving today aren't arriving 
which means Walmart shelves are partially empty, which is bad because Walmart, as an example, has something contractual offsets. They actually say, you're, you don't have enough goods here. We're losing sales. We're penalizing you and offsetting your receivables. So we got to really understand the disruption that the distress created for the customer. We've got to really also, as part of that, then understand the supply chain. How behind were they with vendors overseas? How complicated is it to build those goods overseas? Could we find a new vendor? And if we did, would that create such significant delays that Walmart shelves would be empty? And were those vendors overseas who were underpaid or paid late coming to us, and by the way, they were, and saying, you know, you really ought to pay us for what somebody else owed, even though you aren't them, and I get it. I don't care. I want my money. So then you start thinking about how much liability am I taking on, even though I'm not legally compelled to, and how does that affect my cash flow model as to what I think I'm going to earn here? The price of poker keeps going up because you have to satisfy the, both the customer who had contractual offsets and the vendors who were not getting paid in the ordinary course as they should have been and had a hook because they were critical vendors who weren't required to supply goods. They could do it or choose not to. Finally, you know, back to crystals, what are you buying and what are you actually getting? Well, wait a second, I've got receivables. I told you there's contractual offsets, so I got to try to calculate that. But what about the inventory? So we had a tremendous amount of inventory. And the inventory looked really big compared to the sales. The, it, the turns didn't look great. We came to learn, to, to, to find in our diligence process that much of the inventory was obsolete or they had seven year supply on something that was still selling. So we were trying to do our purchase based on the asset value held by the senior secured creditor. And that, to negotiate with them and to do that we had to really understand the assets and they had to understand the assets so it's really talking to the bank and saying bank mr banker have you run the inventory sitting there against the actual sales and how have you accounted for it in your abl type advance for all this inventory offset because there's really a negotiation for the purchase price so my real overview is if I'm trying to get a going concern, what are the pieces that lead to a going concern and how am I going to get them and what it's really going to cost me to get them? And that was really the core of the diligence for us in that transaction and most buy side transactions. And the seller, of course, being distressed will tell you that everything's going to come up rosy and it's going to be awesome. So you can't exactly, I mean, not, not that they're bad people, but they're, they're backs against the wall they may be a little more optimistic um, or in denial, as I said earlier, than perhaps the, the new buyer needs to be. So you have the, the final thing is you lack the advantage of being an insider in that transaction. Now, a strategic buyer is your better buyer because they can walk in the door and understand immediately everything or most everything about the company. And the, and so they have the advantage of collapsing costs. An example of this would be, I did probably a dozen distressed printers over the years selling them. And the buyers were other printers who already had that machine that cost $7 million to do high volume printing on, but it only ran in the morning and the afternoon, didn't run all night. So they could close down the other facility, move the revenue in, hire some key people, hire the sales and consolidate costs. Your best buyer in distress setting is typically going to be a strategic buyer who doesn't need education about what they're buying. They know what they're getting and they can bid. So, you know, from the buyer's perspective, it depends if you're financial or strategic. And if you're strategic, you're probably the better buyer. Bruce, I want to pick up on something uh, you said about inventory really fast. Um, that is probably the legal provision that I spend the most amount of time um, negotiating and drafting in a distress situation because of this value concept. Um, and the other thing I'll note is in if you are representing the buyer, um, those of you who kind of participate in typical M&A deals, everyone's like, oh, it's simple. We'll do a post-closing true up and we'll get a chance to understand what the inventory is and it'll all just come out in the wash at the end. In a distressed situation, there is 
very rarely a post-closing true-up mechanism because of the fact that the seller is usually going away. Your ability to collect for post-closing liabilities is only as good as the seller is collectible, and they usually are not. And so the inventory needs to get done either pre-closing or there needs to be some sort of escrow concept available in order to um, recover against. And the inventory is driving value as well. So you often need to have that figured out pre-closing too, because it's going to dictate a lot of what's going on in the purchase price. So when, when you're thinking about inventory, it's not just the mechanical piece, but it's, okay, how are we going to draft this in the legal documents? Because we're not going to just be able to deal with this kind of in the wash post-closing. So it becomes a very important provision. And, and just to go back- It's a little bit like getting your house in order then, uh, Crystal, right? What you were talking is. about before. And the seller wants certainty as to price. So they want to shift that risk to the mm -hmm. buyer. The buyer wants to really know what they're getting. And it creates, you know, some dueling negotiations and valuation considerations. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, this, is, this is all very good. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, marketing and, and the sales process for uh, trying to sell a distressed business. Um, you know, it's often the cases that circumstances surrounding a distressed company don't allow for the typical marketing or sale process. What are some other options that you've seen, Crystal? So um, I want to go back to what Bruce said, which is um, kind of the strategic, the advantage of selling to a strategic. Um, I think mm -hmm. that is actually one of the benefits of an investment banking group is while you might not be able to run a full marketing process and have the, you know, 50 page confidential information memorandum and all of this like huge academic activity that happens before the sale, you can actually kind of cut through some of that with a great team like Lazier and they have connections that are potentially in your industry and you can go straight to strategics and do almost an abbreviated marketing process. Um, and, and maybe I'll let you guys speak on it. I see you nodding your head since this is definitely your area, but it, you don't have to do the full SIM is, I guess, the point from a legal perspective. You can do an abbreviated process. Yeah, what we're looking at on the sell side is not your typical sell process. First of all, financial buyers usually can't learn the company quick enough to, to be bitter within the time frame available. I mean, it's great to have family offices who want to invest or distress investors, but the guy who competes with that customer every day actually understands their business and she can make an offer quicker than someone else. So one of the things we do is we do a contribution margin analysis. So let me explain what that means. We all know what a gross margin is. And then you have your SG&A costs, your selling general administrative costs. So what we're really doing is saying to our buyers, hey, Mr. or Mrs. Buyer, this is the contribution margin you get. Your costs are your costs, but you on our 50 million in sales are going to pick up $22 million in margin after just the product cost. So I don't know what your SG&A ours. Ours were more than the 28. That's why we're in distress. But you already got a CFO. You've already got a warehouse. You already got a distribution software. You've got all these things. And we sell them on contribution margin. And they get the benefit of being a cost consolidator in a meaningful way. So number one is, we aren't selling it with all of our cost structure. We're selling with a very narrow cost structure about the gross margin. And that's very different than a typical going concern. Two, you want an auction process. I mean, you would think that many people would think, oh, you have a natural buyer. Let's just call that person and they will be our buyer and we'll get it done quickly. The problem is there's no call to action for them to move expeditiously. An example would be, and, and I had a guy, a private equity guy who's been a friend of mine forever who said, quote, time does the best due diligence, meaning the passage of time tells if it really is gonna work or not. So they want time to do their due diligence for them as the ice cube melts and as your opportunities narrow, you're talking to one buyer. Then typically the buyer will begin to feel the strength of their position start dictating terms. Oh, well, it could be better for me if X, so now the term is X. If you do not have the horse race that is an auction process where each horse has blinders on, can't see the other horses, running till its heart explodes, you will not get these done typically. So 
What I really want to do is create an auction environment with strategics who understand it. And in the very beginning, I tell them the time frame, you dictate when each element of the time frame is going to come through. And one of the big issues in the distress setting is educating the buyers and their counsel. Because we have on the phone folks who clearly understand distress really well, but don't assume everyone does. So we've been in situations where they have counsel that isn't as as uh, deep as, as a McDonald Hopkins, and their lawyer is fearful of things you should not be fearful of and not fearful of those which you should be fearful of. So educating the advisors and trying to get them comfortable with the risk, the mechanism that Michael spoke about, which mechanism and the risk factor associated with that, why they should get comfortable with that and believe it's going to be okay. Getting the advisors to understand the deal if they're not of your quality of counsel today is really an issue. And, you know, and and so what really happens is you need a short time frame, you need an auction environment. And the final thing is I never do this in a typical sale. If I'm to sell a great company, I never name a price in terms and offer it to somebody because I just put a ceiling on my price in terms. Why would I want to do that? Maybe somebody would have bid more. In a distressed environment, especially with not deeply sophisticated buyers on the other side, you almost have to give them a structure. Because if you say to them, you tell me the deal, they'll be so lost on how to handle it, they usually won't bid. I'll go to them with a deal, which is wildly better for creditors than a liquidation. But not everything may be in the blue sky you could have hoped for. And I will have them bid against a proposal and that's something in a going concern sale i never have done never would do so there's some very there are some stark differences in speed and putting an offer out and and and, and educating their advisors are the big three crystal do you do you uh, have the opportunity to get involved in in some of these auction processes uh, do you see I, that too in, in some of your work i do and i i wanted to um they, I, I'm glad you actually brought up kind of the educating the advisors because a lot of what's happening if if you are representing the buyer in particular is you are pricing the risk. Um, Bruce at one point said, you know, you're probably paying a little bit over liquidation value. Um, so with that lower price usually comes with less in terms of legal recourse against the seller post closing. So what the seller is saying is, okay. I could just liquidate these assets and, you know, take my cash and pay my bank and kind of walk away and have fewer post-closing liabilities. But you buyer are going to pay me like a little bit more than liquidation value, which has value. But for that, you buyer are not going to get this open-ended indemnification and all of this recourse that you would see in a typical deal. So part of what both sides are doing is pricing the risk. So if the buyer is paying just a little bit over liquidation value, the seller is only going to give a little bit in terms of representations and warranties. So there really is a get what you pay for and balancing that. And that is part of what legal counsel on behalf of both buyer and seller are trying to do. And so if I am representing a seller and I get a purchase agreement in a distress situation that's 80 pages with all of these reps and warranties and indemnification. It's usually pretty clear that opposing counsel is not you know, familiar with distress sales. And that really does slow down the process in a situation where speed is key. And then on the flip side, when I am representing the buyer, we try to cut right to the chase because we want our bid to be competitive. We want to be quick. We want to find a way to preserve value and get it quickly. And so part of what I, the conversation Michael and I actually have with our buyers are, um, what price are you paying? What is your expectation? And if there are a couple of things we need to figure out post-closing without recourse, are you kind of factoring that into your purchase price when you're making it? Yeah, and if I could if I could uh, chime in, I think both on Crystal and Bruce's one, a seller comment and another, a buyer comment. From the seller side, and this goes back to all the seller considerations and limiting post-closing liability and how to run a process, as lawyers, we also want to advise the seller specifically about fiduciary duties in terms of making decisions that are in the best interest of the, of the, of the enterprise and of all the stakeholders. And you know, to the extent that there's situations where 
you know, you want to save a, a particular management team to move forward. Well, you know, th there could be some insider considerations there that if someone's looking back at the transaction, they might, you know, maybe take some issue with. So, you know, thinking through whether or not it makes sense to have an independent director or if you already do, that's great. Or having a CRO in place to sort of run the transaction side from a seller perspective that kind of separates, you know, the, the current management from the actual sort of restructuring. Or even, you know, maybe that's a reason why you pick a, a receivership or a bankruptcy or something, because you're at least disclosing to the world, hey, we're, we're selling, we're doing a deal here. It might be, you know, there might be some insider issues, but it's the best deal that we could get. So I do, we just always want to make sure that we affirm that. And then on the buyer side, you know, in terms of another structure and sort of being in the driver's seat and having maximum advantage, you know, buying buying the debt, if, if there's a situation where there's a, there's a lender that's, you know, secured in all the assets, going to them and either buying at a discount, which is terrific, and then using the delta between what you paid for and what the total amount of the debt is as a credit bid essentially against the assets, which you can do, you know, both, you know, in and out of court, you're in a foreclosure process or through a court process, you really have the driver's seat. So even at an auction, I mean, especially if you buy something at a discount, you know, you're already bidding the paper up to the amount of the debt plus whatever breakup fee. So even if you ultimately lose, you could still capitalize by making some return on the initial debt purchase. And that, that's just another another strategy and aspect that I know we, we're running toward the end here. I wanna make sure we touch on that briefly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let, let me ask you a question that, that has come in uh, and maybe it's uh, not the right time or place for it, but uh, I think we can handle this. Is there a link between um, signs of distress and what you see on financial statements? I uh, was wondering if you could uh, comment on uh, what you see and what, what that link might be. I'll, I'll take an answer on that. Um, the reality is financial statements are not real time. If you get them 15 or 20 days after the close of the prior month, that's good. Um, but we have clients in the distress world where they're much slower. That's number one. Number two is how accurate are those financials? Uh, Crystal and I have spoken a bit about inventory and about a loss in inventory that hasn't been recognized. Are those financials accurate when there's two million of bad inventory that has yet to be written off and therefore run through the P&L as an expense creating two million greater in losses? So in an ideal world, crisply well done financials on a timely basis will tell the story of distress. They really will. But in a lot of distressed companies, they don't have crisply put together close in real time financials. But if you really did get them in that basis, the balance sheet starts telling a story. If current assets to current liabilities on the last couple of years have been a two to one ratio, and now they're one and a half to one, and you have operating losses on your on your income statement, and you, you'll see those operating losses essentially eating the excess current assets. You're going to see that. So well done financials on a timely basis that are accurate um, should be very reflective of what's going on within the company. My experience tells me that with many distressed companies, that isn't the case because their financials aren't very good. And that's and when I talked about the sowing the seeds way at the beginning, it's about not good financial information read by people who don't really understand it. Crystal, do you, do you see that too a little bit? I do, and I think it kind of goes back to one of one of the hallmarks of a distressed business. Um, it, to what Bruce was saying earlier is that there is a bit of a denial, and so there really isn't always um, the the record keeping isn't always being kept up. And so part of what also makes due diligence really complex, particularly financial due diligence, is um, not being able to see that information in real time, which is also why there's so much power in a strategic buyer, as Bruce was saying earlier, they will actually be able to perhaps see some of the things that are a little bit hidden in the financial statements and or just see it doing a walk around the plant or a walk around the site um, that a purely financial buyer wouldn't be able to see um, just by face value by looking at some old financial statements. So it it really is why having a good financial advisor looking at these things and helping you, it becomes really important because it's not like a normal situation where you see it and you can believe it, that this is a little bit harder to sift through. Okay, um, we've got about three minutes left here. Um, why don't we just go uh, 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 through each of the, the four panelists, uh, give it a, a quick, short uh, 
closing observation. We'll start with Sherry. Thank you, uh, Pete. Um, I think what you've seen today is um, a, lo a lot of options here. Um, there can be a lot of creativity and um, it's really important to have the right team in place, whether you're a buyer, a seller, or a lender, and um, you need advisors that are experienced in the distressed world. Uh, this is not the time for advisors where it's their first rodeo. So okay. thank you very much. Uh, yeah, Michael, what uh, what's your takeaway? Uh, my takeaway is it's, this has been really fun uh, uh, doing this panel with with my fellow panelists. Um, unfortunately for you know a lot of folks out there, um, I think the distressed asset acquisition world is going to be a bit uh, you know hotter over the next you know in the coming months than it had been over the last few years, and and that's uh, both a good and a bad thing. And there's going to be value out there for for interested buyers. All right, Crystal. <laughs> I may have, I, I know I said this earlier, but maybe just say it one more time, um, control the things you can control. There's so much that you can't in a transaction situation and um, your advisors can help you as a buyer or a seller um, kind of control certain things and mitigate certain risks. So understanding right. that I think is important. Great, uh, and Bruce. Thank you. Um, my best advice always for the distressed company is to get real, quit living in denial, surround yourself with smart people and have a plan. You know, um, it doesn't get better when you're losing money every day and you're running out of liquidity. And from the buyer side, there's an opportunity to really add incredibly profitable revenue at very low pricing. If you surround yourself with the right advisors and act expeditiously. So it creates a lot of opportunity both to save value for the distress company, to create value for the buyer, but you got to be surrounded by smart people who know how to make, who know how to lead you through this. And, uh, it, but there's great opportunities. I've, I had one client who was a distressed client of mine when I met him. He did a bunch of acquisitions of distressed companies that I represent him and sold for 44 million in cash. And it was all because he understood distress from having done it himself. So, uh, and we'd of yep. course be delighted to help anyone. All right, well, um, we, we promised to conclude this at, at one o'clock today. Um, if you have questions that did not get addressed, uh, again, please email, send an email to events at mcdonaldhopkins.com or contact any one of the, the panelists individually. Our, our contact information is on the screen there. Uh, we appreciate uh, your, your attention and hope this was useful. Uh, for everyone that, that attended. So thank you for joining us and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone.